right. Well, sure. thank you very much for coming at 5.30 on a Friday. Randall has been doing these panels for a long, long time, and he said this is the best attendance he's ever seen at a Friday 5.30 Absolutely. panel. Absolutely, uh, by far. So thank you very much. Give yourselves a hand. Give yourselves a hand. Because net neutrality, as you've heard, is an extremely important issue right now. Um, obviously, you seem to be concerned about it, or at least you want to learn a little more about it. Um, but sometimes, oh, so um, my name is Andrew Glazier. I'm an attorney licensed in Florida and Georgia. Uh, in a past life, I have done work uh, for telecommunications companies, including, in many cases, analyzing how the net neutrality rules would affect them. I'm now more of a general transactional lawyer for small businesses, helping innovative small businesses get going, and also still dealing with some technology law. And first up, we have Randall Schwartz. Oh, hi. Hey, everybody. Hi, hi. I'm back. I wasn't here last year, but I'm so happy to be back. I'm back again, yes. And on like seven panels, so this is one of seven. <laughs> uh, I'm, uh, my concern with net neutrality, uh, in brief, is I cut cable five years ago, and I watch a lot of Netflix and Amazon Prime and uh, Hulu, and uh, I, I'm really concerned that if the person that controls the last mile also gets to decide how fast I see Netflix, that is an issue. That's a huge issue. That's why we're here. Next, we have Kara Chapel. Sorry, it's Kara. I'm Cara. actually Supergirl. So. <laughs> um, I haven't been back to Dragon Con in a long time, so I'm happy to be back. And I've been on a panel with Randall before, and we did a stellar job. So let's hope we can pull that off again for you today. Um, net neutrality is pretty important. I think one of the most confusing things about it, though, is the name of net neutrality. What does that actually mean to everybody? Is it neutral? Do we care? Or does it actually mean that your access to the internet should be free? So uh, let's just start there and move along. Hi, Nathan White. I worked for Congress for five years, and since then I've worked on tech policy and politics and media and all sorts of different things. Uh, I've been working on net neutrality, I think, probably since 2010, and it's one of those things I, I thought would be fairly easy to resolve, and so sometimes I'm still shocked that we're still talking about it. I'm here because I'm going to argue that it's not about Netflix. I could care less about Netflix. I no. think it's about the future of how the Internet works, uh, and I'm going to try to explain the Internet in ways that are not super, super boring or super, super wrong. Uh, so looking forward to getting into that. <laughs> that is always the problem when we translate technology to policy. Good job. Uh, finally, we have, and last but not least, we have Meredith Rose. Hello. Uh, I am, as you heard, Meredith Rose. Uh, I work at a group called Public Knowledge. Uh, we are sort of neck deep in the net neutrality fight and have been for several years. Um, I work on a combination of tech, regulatory, and intellectual property issues. Uh, so y'all should come see my Monday panel, if anyone's actually going to be here on Monday, about cosplay in the Supreme Court. Um, same, shameless self-promotion there. Uh, <laughs> Uh, yeah, so again, we've sort of been working at this. I come at this from um, an FCC policy wonk position. Uh, I do a lot of admin law. Um, and so, got, you know, obviously I care a lot about net neutrality. Uh, I think I probably wouldn't be up here if I didn't. I can't give quite as moving a reason as the other folks up here. Uh, but safe to say I care about it in a deeply nerdy way, uh, a deeply nerdy legal way. Uh, so that's why I'm here. All right, thank you. Um, and actually, I'm going to go right back to Meredith to kick this off. Um, could you explain a bit about what, oh, uh, sorry, before I go on, those of us on the panel who are lawyers are here on our own personal capacities. We are not representing any of our clients. Nothing we say is representative of what our clients say. They are our own personal beliefs. And I'm the not law. a lawyer. I'm not a lawyer. <laughs> Belief for you. Also Just not a, a felon. lawyer. Just a felon. <laughs> Uh, Meredith, could you explain a bit about how we got here, what the legislative history is, how this fight started, and where it ended up? Yeah, sure. So to preface, I am a lawyer, uh, and my client is the American people. Um, <laughs> I'm we a thank you for the pro lawyer. bono work. Yeah, basically. Um, yeah, so the, to, I'm going to do my best. Those of you who really follow this a lot probably know my colleague, Harold Feld, uh, who is sort of the the or wonk of telecom history, so I'm going to do my best to channel him. Uh, the basic story is that, for all intents and purposes, modern telecommunications regulations started back in the 1930s, uh, when we had the Communications Act of 1934. Uh, and back then, we had a telephone monopoly. We basically had a very sort of limited spread of offerings as to what we considered communications. You had wireless radio. You had a telephone monopoly. Uh, and for the next 
uh, like 40 to 50 years, really. Uh, that was kind of basically it. Um, you had a monopoly that controlled everything that could connect into the network. Uh, AT&T owned the whole thing. Um, those of you who are old enough might remember having to lease your telephones to connect into the network. Um, and there was a whole case about that, like what you could and could not attach to the end of your telephone was a big deal. Uh, it was this, this giant, you know, it was sort of a headache. Um, and then as we went along, you started getting to the 60s and 70s, you started getting these kind of non-telephone networks that started cropping up. There was a plan to build um, what essentially nowadays looks like a fax network that would have broadcast on microwave from St. Louis to Chicago. Uh, for some some reason, this never took off. Um, <laughs> and you started getting all these things that, that didn't really fit into the framework. Um, the 1934 Act was what they called technologically biased, which meant that it, can, it really cared about how you got things done. Did you use the telephone lines? Did you use wireless radio? Did you use microwaves? What part of the spectrum did you use? That was what they, and they didn't care what you did with it. They just cared about what part of the infrastructure you were using. Um, and they kind of, you know, a little bit towards like the 80s and early 90s and sort of tweak, tweak the Communications Act here and there. And in 96, you get the Telecommunications Act, which amended the, the 1934 Act. And they rejiggered a lot of it so that you got things where it's no longer based on the technology used. It's based on the function that the service provides. Um, and so basically, you ended up with sort of two, for our purposes of discussion today, we ended up with two big buckets. One of them is information services, uh, which were actually so start off with Title II. Title II is telecommunication services. Um, now, at the time, this was primarily telephone. If you actually read through the whole legislative history of the Telecommunications Act, which I had to do as an intern, I don't recommend it. Um, it's, I think they talk about uh, cable, cable internet exactly zero times. Uh, they did not see this coming. <laughs> they thought that internet was going to be delivered over power lines. That was like kind of the hotness at the time. Uh, that did not pan out, unsurprisingly. Uh, satellite internet also didn't really pan out in anything close to what they thought was going to happen. Um, and so really when they were talking about telecommunication services, you know, they defined it as, you know, they have a specific definition of moving, moving telecommunications from one to the other. And, and for better or for worse, it, you know, that definition is sort of what we're arguing right now. The other bucket is Title I. The Title I is everything else. Um, stuff that they sort of reasonably under ancillary authority in a lot of cases, uh, you know, they call it an information service. It's, it's things that they have the capacity to deal with in a very, very limited fashion because in some way it impacts the telecommunication services that are under Title II. What um, sorts of things are information services, by the way? Uh, well, other than tele, yeah. other than uh, you know uh, what we're arguing about today, the short version is whatever they don't want to deal with. Um, mm. So VoIP, voice over IP telephony, for a long time has I I think they're actually still kicking the can on that one. Uh, they, they've people have brought it up and been like it's telephone service, so that's Title Two, right? And they're like, eh, we don't feel like it, and they just kind of kick the can, and they've been doing that for approximately twenty years. Um, and so that, that's kind of the idea of information services. That fax, that microwave fax service would have been an information service, for example. Like anything, we connecting to computers, that would have been an information service. Um, and so, or at least under the, like, connecting to computers as it was done in, like, the late 1980s, that would have been an information service. Um, and so basically, the, the authority that the uh, FCC has under each of these two buckets is vastly different. Like, you have under, under Title I, you basically have... Uh, you have kind of this thing called Section 706, which is basically gives it the uh, gives the FCC the ability to promote competition and increase infrastructure investment. Mm -hmm. um, they do a bunch of stuff under this section now. Uh, they tried to do net neutrality rules under 706 back in 2010. The DC Circuit did not like that. They said this is stretching the definition of your authority under this statute too far. Uh, and then they kind of like wink, wink, nudge, nudge, like, but if you did Title II. Maybe we'd think about it. Uh, and they kind of actually laid out a very interesting roadmap. And so title. Yeah, I just wanted to interject. It's Having read that opinion, it's one of the most interesting opinions I've ever read because it basically says, we like what you're doing, but we just you just can't do it this way. So do it this other way, and we'll totally approve it. Yeah. Even though we're not actually saying we're going to approve it because the court would never, ever hint <laughs> at future rulings. But if you follow this roadmap, you got a good shot. Yeah, it's, it's a very wink, wink, nudge, nudge kind of approach to, uh, to judicial review. Um, and Title II has 
a lot of people call it utility regulation. Basically, Title II gives the FCC a big toolbox of stuff that they can do. Um, they can do everything from non-discrimination mandates all the way up to things like uh, rate regulation. Now, when they did the reclassification, the reclassification order, which is the 2015 net neutrality proceeding, they said, okay, we're going to keep all this stuff on this side. You know, we're going to keep, um, you know, being able to uh, mandate non-discrimination and interconnection agreements and a whole bunch of other sort of very wonky infrastructure parts. And they're like, but we're not going to do, we're going to uh, forbear is the technical term. We're going to forbear on doing things like rate regulation. Uh, so that's actually been off the table since they did this, which is a fact that a lot of people opposed to net neutrality very conveniently forget. Uh, they are legally, they kicked that one off the table at the beginning. Um, so that's kind of where we are right now uh, in a very roundabout way. But that's, that's how we got to where we are. And now we have the new chairman who is trying to basically put the genie back in the bottle and say, no, 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 this is actually a Title I. Uh, we, we made a mistake. Don't look so over the here. next time you get Rickrolled, remember it all started in 1934. <laughs> uh, Nathan, could you explain a little bit about what actually what protections are in net neutrality? Obviously, we not not everything that applies to telephones applies to net neutrality and communicate broadband communication, which is why they did forbear from implementing a lot of these arcane regulations. Some of which are things like uh, disability access. They they you can't just use a TDD service to access the internet, really. So there are other things like that that just don't apply to broadband, they forbear. But what did they add that was new? Sure. So I'm not a lawyer, but my job is to try to explain this kind of stuff to members of Congress and their staff. So I, I'm going to talk about it in a little bit of a different way. And I'm going to talk about it in the way, the way that you understand and experience the internet has always had net neutrality. And that is because the way that the internet works, I'm sure you've heard this, is a network of networks. And so think of it like this, that everyone in this room runs and operates their own network. If I want to send this message, which is my name, let's say it's an email, to somebody in the back of the room, I don't give one message to one person. I break it up into hundreds of little pieces, and I say where I want it to go. And you are able to work into the network because you know how to read that metadata on the top of the message, and all you need to do is take a message and hand it to the person behind you, and eventually it'll circulate and all get to the right place. Because every network, all you need to do is take the data in and hand it to the closest network in the next direction. So the net neutrality has always meant you don't really care what the data is. You just sort of hand it on to the next person. If we change that, if let's say everybody on this side of the room is owned by one company, and they say, we're going to treat it differently. When it comes onto our block of the network, we're going to slow this down, or we're going to prioritize this, or if you want to watch Netflix and that's taking a lot of our bandwidth, we're going to charge you extra. That is the difference that we want to stop. Um, as Meredith mentioned, the internet used to come in over the phone, and so it was like you used the phone. The first person who called gets in. If two people try to call in at the same time, the first one gets in. It's, it, the internet was that way for people, so it made sense. And, and I think it was 2002, when we started getting broadband internet and it started becoming this different thing, people thought, well, maybe we should change how we consider this. But even when they changed the rules, there was always a broad, there were always net neutrality principles. They always kind of operated under net neutrality, even though the rules weren't really there. And then Verizon sued and said, hey, these rules shouldn't exist because you don't have the legal authority to put these rules on us. But they always operated under net neutrality. They just said, you don't really have the authority to put these rules on us. And that's when the courts agreed. And they said, you know, you're right. They don't have the authority to put these rules on you, but they would if they did this other thing. So we've really never had a period where we don't have net neutrality because it's how the internet works. It's how every network talks to each other. It's how we get free speech on the internet. And that's why it's such a fundamental fight for people like me because if you say like entire parts of the network can be walled off and can prioritize content or slow down content that they don't like or charge users more money, we're dramatically changing the infrastructure of the internet for the way that it's always operated. And if we start doing that, well, that would suck. So we're not going to let it happen. I will. I will add uh, from from the policy, and this is this is mostly just a storytelling exercise. Um, but when Verizon sued for the 2010 rules, literally every other telecom company basically said, "Shut up! Shut up! Shut up!" Uh, and tried to get them to sit down. And Verizon's like, "No, we're going to fight this." And everyone's like, "You realize that they're going to say you need to do Title II?" And Verizon's like, "I can't hear you." And then. 
they Leroy Jenkins into the DC Circuit, and everything just. And then we got Title Two, so they're, uh, they're still eating that one. So I, I guess we've 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 been in, implied this, but just to make it clear, so if everybody in the room doesn't know, the the rule we've always kind of had title, or we've always kind of had net neutrality, but the the authority for the rules have changed. In 2015, they established bright line rules that the courts were going to approve. They said net neutrality; these are the rules. This is what you have to do. And it was kind of done. It's still working through the courts because everything gets uh, legis or everything gets sued these days. Uh, and now with the new administration and there's a new chairman of the FCC, they have uh, opened a new proceeding to examine whether or not they should revoke the 2015 rules um, and replace it with something. So the, the rules themselves um, largely function around making sure that ISPs are honest with their customers. Uh, you can't block content based on people not paying you. You can't, uh, you have to be open and transparent, Let treat all traffic equally. Um, you have to be transparent with your practices. When you say, oh, you have 250 gigabytes of data per month, you actually better be getting 250 gigabytes of data per month. There can't be, oh, you get 250, but if you go over that, we're going to start charging, uh, charge you a convenience fee of $5 per every gigabyte you use over 250 gigabytes. Oh, and we also didn't tell you, you were anywhere near your cap. You can't do that with the transparency rules. Um, the other big thing, and this is one that the telecoms really didn't like, um, there's no paid prioritization. You cannot pay to have the content move faster. You cannot, uh, so Netflix and Comcast can't come to a deal where Netflix pays Comcast more money in order to get that data through faster. And this one can seem a little odd to understand at first until you realize that if Netflix is paying for access to get it faster, Guess who's going to incur those charges ultimately? We are. We are. The other thing that has been outlawed is what's called zero rating. And this is when uh, you have certain content given to you for free. It doesn't count against any of your data caps and you don't have to actually pay for it. Um, this sounds like a great deal. It's wonderful. I can stream all sorts of music for free and if I'm streaming this music, it doesn't count against my data cap. The problem is it's designed specifically to encourage you to go to that service and it drives up the cost of everything else going to that service. So I'll, I'll actually jump in here. The FCC was debating the zero rating part. They never actually came to a conclusion by the time that uh, the administration was up, but that was something that like a lot of groups were, you know, because there is a legitimate like social benefit in, in not, especially when you're dealing with mobile, uh, because data caps on landline connections are totally arbitrary. Like they're not, you're not stressing anybody's network with the amount of like traffic that I am generating out of my home unless I am I don't know like running Netflix 2.0 out of my apartment which um, would be a violation of your contract with the ISP anyways yeah um, so most of the time this comes in most of the time this comes into mobile broadband stuff um, and you know there is there was a very robust debate and a lot of the public interest groups who were into the net neutrality thing ended up on both sides of this um, but that was that's a thing that was very very much an open question about like under these title two rules does zero rating count as a violation of net neutrality or not? And and I'm glad you brought up mobile. That's an there there is a small difference between mobile broadband and generic broadband. Um, there's there's a it's based partly in the fact that there has always been a huge difference in the way the FCC has regulated landlines versus mobile devices, um, and a lot of the things that were for the, a lot of Title II regulations that are forbeared do not apply to the mobile broadband. They're actually regulated under what's called Title III. Um, so that was another problem with realigning under Title II is that, well, you have the mobile telephony part regulated under Title III, but now you have the broadband part regulated under Title II. So to, count, to deal with that, there are some slight differences in the net neutrality rules for mobile and landline broadband, but it's nothing worth really debating and it's very arcane and technical. But I wanted to get another imp another view on this. Kara, um, wonder, I know that a lot of people, some people are not happy and there are some legitimate arguments against this sort of regulation. I was wondering if you could go into some of this. Well, I, I think, and I just found this information out, uh, one of the legitimate and probably the biggest and most important and will catch the most attention arguments is within the last day or so, Apple came out and said that they have a real big problem with that. And they said, end quotes, broadband providers should not create 
paid fast lanes on the internet. So that's coming from Apple, and they carry a lot of weight, being one of the you know, largest companies, tech companies in the world now. Um, so I think we have to now look at this. Maybe Congress has to look at this from a different viewpoint. Uh, you know, who's going to be uh, carrying the biggest weight? Um. Yeah, and I, I, again, jumping in as a, a DC policy wonk, um, a lot of the push uh, back against net neutrality is this like authority question. It's you know. Is, is broadband internet so far out of, I mean, like, so I, I talked earlier about if you look through the legislative history of, of the Telecommunications Act of 96, you see exactly zero mentions of cable-based broadband, because uh, they, they didn't, you can't really future-proof legislation. It's, it's a perennial problem in Washington. You try to legislate for something you don't know exactly how it's going to play out. Um, and so there is a, there's an argument that floats around um, that basically says, look, this is, this is such a rejiggering away from the way that Congress thought the future was going to look, that we need to bring it back to Congress, and that it is too much for an agency to deal with on its own. Um, and if you're a constitutional law, you get into lawyer, you get into like separation of powers arguments. But basically, it's like, this is really big. We need to bring it to Congress. Now, realistically, looking at Congress and expecting them to do anything is mm. um, And so that's kind of the argument against that, is that this is, this is a huge deal. This is something that is already happening. We've had like multiple instances of, of throttling and blocking and, and all kinds of bad behavior that these things are designed to prevent. And like, as a purely as a matter of expediency, like you have to do first aid before you can perform surgery. So. And it's interesting, you, you, the blocking, um, that's one of the things specifically that you can't do, throttling and blocking. You can't slow someone's connection down to 50 bits per second. Uh, but there have, and she, she's right, there have been blocking problems in the past. Until these rules, the FCC couldn't do anything about it. It's been public pressure that has gotten the ISPs to back down on these sorts of things. And so that's something to remember when you're considering whether or not you like having net neutrality. Um, another thing that's often argued by the telecoms uh, is that this will discourage investment. It's going to stifle small businesses having to comply with all these regulations, prevents them from entering into what could be for those small businesses very beneficial arrangements if they're getting money for their content. What if the ISPs want to pay providers for their content? What if we turn it around? That's money that these small businesses can't get. So I'm wondering, uh, could Randall speak to some of that? I could probably try. Um, so the issue with that, again, would be that um, um, it, uh, it's actually said really well. I, well. One of the researches I did for this particular talk was that uh, there's a great article in TechCrunch about that. And uh, the argument would be that, um, and I've lost my entire train of thought. Um, why, why can't we, why, why are we blocking the market here? It's going to stifle innovation and we can't pay providers for their content anymore. Right, because uh, again, it's going to make a, 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 a multiple tier market. So like Netflix could pay, but then how would these uh, ISPs who didn't want to play with Netflix get their money? And so you end up creating a, a, a very scattered market. Or I would have to be with a particular ISP. Like let's say um, I'm on Comcast, and so I know that there's some services Comcast offers for their customers that are different from the other services that are provided by other uh, things. So I have to be on the right thing. I mean, it's sort of like what's happening already now when we hear that um, Disney's moving out of Netflix, going onto their own service. I have to start subscribing to multiple services, which is really crazy. CBS All Access, anybody? Yeah. Any Trekkies in the room? But, but Randall, what is a poor Comcast to do? I've spent hundreds <laughs> of millions of dollars building out this network. They already have my money. All of all of the traffic that I've built this network, and it's being eaten up by Netflix. Why can't I go to Netflix and say, look, you are reliant on my network to reach your customers. I have to build more towers to carry your uh, coverage to my uh, customers. You should help me pay for those new towers so that your clients can get what they're paying for. Help me build out this network. It's so expensive. There I is, can't invest without your help. I, I will point out, this is a perennial uh, beef. That, sorry, this is my soapbox. Um, <laughs> this, this particular line of argument really pisses me off. Uh, it's what they make. It's I, what no, they, no, it's, it's exactly what they make. This is 100% accurate to the... <laughs> We appear to have some issues with the uh, box. If it's we get Comcast. some technical help, um, yeah, it's Comcast. Blame them for everything, yeah, exactly. right? Exactly. Uh, Blame it on Comcast. Um, yeah. So the the line of argument is basically like, how will we invest in our networks if we cannot make money by doing these things that would violate net neutrality rules? We are like 
clearly a low margin business that has no capital to spend. Um, and so they talk about, oh, this will kill investment. That's the refrain. This will kill investment. We'll have to stop investing in our networks. And they say this to the FCC. And then they turn around and on their investor calls and their filings at the SEC, they're like, it's been a boom year. We've invested like $200 billion in building on our network. And then they turn back around and go to the FCC on Tuesday and go, we have no money. Um, so, you know, to which my response is, well, you're either lying to the FCC or you're lying to your investors. One of which is going to get your wireless license if you have it revoked. That's lying to the FCC. The other one is going to land you in jail. So take your pick. Yeah. But Meredith, nice. you keep telling me that I need to get rural broadband. And the problem with rural broadband is people live really far away from each other. And so if there's 10 customers over 100 miles, it's really expensive to get to them. They should move and closer. And so I need to make a little <laughs> bit more money. It's a margin call. I can build out networks in neighborhoods like New York where everybody's close together, but if you want me to get to rural broadband and you want the, the people in the flyover country to catch over, it's already marginal and maybe I'm not making enough profit. So if you got rid of net neutrality and I could charge Netflix to help me build out the network, then we'd have rural broadband and you'd be so happy. I'm well, glad Nathan. you brought that up, Nathan. Uh, no, I'm, I'm Because, because there, are two, there are two responses to that. One is the government is already paying you to go out Thank into you. rural areas. Areas. Where did that money go? Gee, we have been doing this. So we have we have a telephone penetration rate of something like 98.7% in this country. And that is because we have a fund that is administered by the FCC. If you actually look closely at your telephone bills, there is a line which will have, I think it's the, the rural access. Universe, universal, universal access. Service, universal, universal access. Service. Um, and that will be I, maybe a couple of bucks on every bill. And Not what even. that is, is the, they call, the telephone companies collect that money from you, turn around, pay it to the FCC, goes into a big pot, and then they proceed to basically auction off, uh, like, it's sort of like a reverse auction, where they're like, all right, we need it built out to this area, this area, and this area. Who can do it for cheap? Uh, and people will bid on the rights to build out to these areas, and they'll get money from the government to do it. We have now expanded the Universal Service Fund to include broadband. <laughs> so guess what? Comcast is already getting paid to go out to these places. So really what they want to do is double dip. Uh, and answer two is something I have forgotten. You guys are so mean to me. I, I actually have a second Comcast. answer, if you don't actually mind. Actually, meaner. I'm just, hey, just as an example. Mr. Comcast, the other thing you could do <laughs> is go to the government and tell the government, hey, we would love to serve these rural customers, your taxpayers. We would love to get them faster service so that you can show them your campaign re-election videos with lots of eagles and American flags. <laughs> Could we please have some money to subsidize this so that your taxpayers can get a, our wonderful service? Okay, okay, I can't win with you guys. Title one, title two, it's confusing. I am a business and I need regulatory certainty. So can't we just go to Congress and can't Congress, the people I've been giving money for the last 10 years, can't they just pass a law <laughs> and let them resolve this once and for all so every time there's a new FCC, I don't have to change my investment model? You want to get certainty from Congress? Yeah. Especially now. When the, when the Communications Act there. took, what, three years to redo? What, the, the, the 96, 96 Act? Act? Oh, the, <laughs> the 96 Act took, took mm, six or seven yeah. years. Yeah. Yeah, it, it took a while. It started in the so, late 80s and then it was sort of abortively. Well, that's just an example for why government doesn't work and we just need to get rid of the FCC entirely. Uh, well, okay, I hate to, well, I hate to interrupt Comedy Hour. We do have a lot of questions coming in for the floor, so. <laughs> yeah. Sir? Yes, um, I used to be a dial-up ISP. I fired my last customer in April. Where we're in a rural area where you don't, some areas you can only get dial-up or Hughes. Or, um, several things. Verizon has at least three times gone to Congress said, if you do this, we'll put, uh, we'll put broadband in rural, and they've gotten something done. Verizon does one thing very, very good. They're an extremely good lobbyist at the, both at the national and the state level. One of the Verizon uh, lobbyists in uh, Richmond, Virginia, changed uh, religions because the uh, new chairman of the State Corporation Commission you know, was a Baptist and he, the old one was a Methodist, so he moved over and joined the, <laughs> the same church. And you know him from church. Oh uh, God. Verizon <laughs> is a past master at gaming the Hearing system. They don't hand off to the nearest place. They, you know. Sir, they say, so do you have a question, sir? Um, <laughs> Why does Comcast? Really, the, the 
the major flaw, I think, in the present system, the root of all the things, is we have a shared monopoly situation instead of a competitive situation. How do we get to the competitive situation? Well, in order to do that, we're going to have to figure out a way to get the antitrust rules to look at this on a smaller level than a national level. Because when you look at it on a national level, which is usually what antitrust regulators look at, we have Comcast and we have Time Warner, we have uh, AT&T and Verizon, we have Google Fiber, we have other startups building out, we have um, four major mobile broadband companies. We have satellite broadband. We have satellite TV. Satellite. Um, and so when you look at it from that perspective, it looks like there should be a lot of competition. The problem is, of course, we all know that in most areas, our co choices are one cable TV provider, one major um, DSL provider, and that's about it for internet, landline internet. So the, we need to get to a model that looks at it differently. And that's what the FCC can do with some of these rules and to mitigate that because um, the, I mean, if you want to jump Yeah, in no, here. I just wanted to piggyback on this. So this is actually, this is the, the gut issue at a lot of what goes on at the FCC. So they actually, every year, uh, the FCC is charged by Congress with doing a review of the state of the broadband market in the United States. Uh, and whenever you deal with any kind of antitrust issue, uh, this is your free legal lesson here, uh, whenever you deal with any kind of antitrust issue, it all boils down to how do you define the market? Do you look at it on a national level, or do you look at it as the fact that I, as a consumer, am subject to a monopoly? I have exactly one choice. Uh, do you think that mobile and fixed broadband are substitutes for one another? This is an ongoing debate that we're rehashing again because under the new chairman of the FCC, uh, if you count mobile broadband penetration as a substitute for regular good old landline broadband, then all of a sudden you are living in competition, Eden. It is just you have choices everywhere, just choices, so many choices you don't know what to do with them. And in some cases they define dial-up internet as a viable competitor to broadband. Or satellite with a data cap. Um, it's, you know, and that's, that's the thing. It's all definitional stretching. So always, whenever you look at, say, like, oh, the state of broad, like, we have great broadband competition in the United States. Look at how they're defining broadband. There's no legal definition of what broadband is. This basically gets set every year when the FCC decides to do this report. So now we have Ajit Pai, a former Verizon lawyer running the FCC. And how do we get a, a, a very just commentary out of that? Well, uh, the former chairman, Tom Wheeler, was also head of the telecom lobby. Uh, sometimes people, before they retire, do good things. <laughs> we're, Meredith, we're just waiting on this one. Meredith, how, how overdue are those end-of-year broadband reports, by the way? Uh, hilariously. Um, they are, well, actually, it depends on the year. Some, some of them have been ridiculously overdue. This one just, I think, just took the reply comments round. So it, it, I don't know. Sometime between now and the heat death of the universe, we'll get the answer. <laughs> Next question, please. Uh, yeah, I, had a, uh, I'm, I'm, I agree with most of the policy th uh, issues behind it. But one issue for me, that sort of a threshold issue, is why is the federal government regulating this in the first place? Isn't this, like, what gives them the power to do this? Do we want a centralized government regulating this? Um, how does that, I guess it's more of a legal question. Yeah. Well, so I'm not a lawyer, though. I actually found that the most compelling answer to that is an economic one, um, which is that in certain instances, actually, if you go out and find the most libertarian law professor, and I went to the University of Chicago, that's all I knew, uh, were libertarian law professors, uh, even the most radical libertarian will say there is a role for government to step in when the free market fails for some reason. When the because there's this idea that like the market will sort it out. Well, the market doesn't always sort it out. You get monopolies. You get um, the classic example is like you know if you go all the way back to the beginning of the railroad system, you had only a handful of people who had the capital investment to put down railroad lines, uh, and so the, all of a sudden they owned the main means of transportation around much of the budding American West. Um, so the argument is basically, if you look at the broadband market and the state that it's in right now, where you've really got maybe, if you're being generous, four major companies that control the access for almost every American, that's a failure of the free market. And two um, of them are trying to merge. Yeah, and, and at any given point, two of them are trying to merge. It's like a constant, like it's like the teacup ride. They're just constantly spinning around each other. Um, and so yeah, it's a failure of the free market and like, you know, no matter how well, radical you are, you say, like, that's the point at which the government has to step in. But one of the problems here is that we're talking about physical resources. There can only be so many cables strung underground and across wires. 
And so we have to manage that space. There's only so many frequencies, so the FCC has to manage that allocation of space and what they do with that. So yes, a government does need to step in here, and uh, that's why there's regulations. Now, what they do with those, that's what we're debating here. If you if you think about it like your water bill, it's a natural monopoly that once you build the infrastructure to bring water to people's houses, it was really, really expensive to build that infrastructure, but adding one more person to the network is basically free. It doesn't really matter. So who's going to compete against you when you already have that infrastructure built? It, it's a tens toward monopoly, and that's why Ma Bell was broken up back in what, the 80s? 85. 80s. Yeah. 82. So, so I'm somewhat Good. confused because maybe 10 minutes ago you were discussing how the de facto state of the network was net neutrality, and that is now a failure of the free market? The, no. the, the thing is that the, the ISP stopped playing nice. When net, the big thing was Netflix was the first one. It's a massive drain on infrastructure. The amount of the amount of data used by streaming services is colossally outweighs the amount of data used by other services. I believe. Okay, yeah. so the last thing that I saw in a report was that Netflix was using approximately forty percent of the broadband data. So you know, clearly people are out there watching what you know what you're watching. Um, I don't know. Has anybody checked with Pornhub lately? <laughs> yeah. So part of it is part of it is that, and part of it is like, look, you know, for all that we all that we crap on the major telcos, they are businesses. They are rational actors who they're rational, self-interested actors. They are going to do everything in the pursuit of their goal, which is making money for their shareholders. That's just that's behavior. Um, and so we have now gotten to the point where there are a handful of extremely large content side companies from which they look and go, you know, when it was just like a bunch of GeoCities homepages that I was serving, like maybe AOL, eh. Like, you know, I was, I was best served by kind of like leaving everything flat and like keeping the network neutral. But now they look and they're like, YouTube, Netflix, Spotify. Uh, and there are deep pockets there. And frankly, there's, there's an opportunity to extract more value for their shareholders by looking at these things with deep pockets. And that's a new development, like in the last, I don't know, five, six years really. Um, even the last like two or three, when you talk about things like the Amazon Fire Stick, like I have, I have taken my Showtime subscription with me to this convention so I can watch the last episodes of Twin Peaks. Um, <laughs> you could not have done that two years ago, so. Which is super cool. My actual question was, yeah. uh, how do terms of service and peering agreements and all of the other uh, contractual obligations between the companies wind up fitting in this scheme of uh, FCC regulatory issues? all you. <laughs> uh, well, so, okay, so I'll take a stab at this. The, the open internet order and the net neutrality rules apply primarily to the last mile, what's called the last mile. It's from the ISP to your house. Uh, it deals with that regulation. It, it, the only places where it gets into the weeds on the internal infrastructure, these peering networks, the ISP to ISP traffic, CDs. is the paid prioritization rule, where you cannot have paid prioritization for content. Um, and so it, it really doesn't affect those agreements. As long as those agreements don't have anything in them that would uh, cause the ISPs to violate net neutrality, then they're fine. And if they do have something in them, most legal agreements have a clause that says if the laws change, this just gets struck. So they simply won't honor that part of the agreement. Next question, please. Uh, hi there. Um, so as far as Netflix goes, I worked there for five years. 70% of the traffic after 7 p.m. in the United States is from Netflix. Um, and we had a huge <laughs> issue with Verizon when I was working there um, where Verizon customers would call in and I could look at their internet speeds and they were insanely low, like below half the speed of dial-up. And that was when Netflix and Verizon were having you know, their, their uh, shit going on. Um, that being said, Netflix, as I understand it, and I was just working on tech support stuff, so I was a little bit lower, um, they offered to plug directly into Comcast servers so that way it wouldn't cause this huge drain on the market that Netflix was like, we will download our movies yeah. to your servers. You have all this extra space. Like, what What about options like that? Have we not looked at those? Is it just the ISPs being jerks? It, it certainly it is an option to do that. Um, and that would not buy, as long as Comcast and, Net, or Comcast and Netflix or Verizon and Netflix don't have some sort of paid arrangement for that, as long as it's purely just, this will make it a lot easier for everybody and easier on our servers. And e even if they had some sort of 
uh, of payments for that. I still don't think that would violate yeah, as pay as prioritization. As long as it wasn't prioritized. Right. Yeah. As long as the traffic I mean, itself isn't is. prioritized. Now, obviously, plugging into the servers will make it go a little faster, but what it's not doing is giving Netflix 70 gigabits per second, whereas everybody else gets 40 gigabits per second. Why haven't they done this? Your guess is as good as mine. Well, uh, as an answer to your question, are they being jerks? I, I think the, the true answer to that is yes, quite possibly. I'm looking at something here that says that they had a September 7th meeting scheduled to discuss the future of net neutrality in D.C., and it was canceled. And a lot of that probably has to do with what Apple just did recently. So are they being jerks? It's pretty well, likely. So and, and uh, let, let me put my Comcast hat back on and, <laughs> and say I have a lot of customers. And sure, I have access to those customers, and I provide a service to them. But I'm competing with the biggest companies in the world. Google and Facebook are way bigger than me, and I'm competing with them, and my shareholders are asking me to make more money. If Google and Facebook can get all this information and sell it about you, why can't I sell access to my customers? Why can't I see what websites you're going to and make data profiles about you? Why can't I monetize my network and find new revenue streams when Facebook and Google are out there doing all this evil stuff? You Be can monetize your network. You just have to tell your customers you're doing that. I, I'm also glad you brought this up, Mr. Comcast. Um, and <laughs> the answer is because I can choose not to use Google, and I can choose, well, you can argue about how much you can choose not to use Google. Um, <laughs> let's, let's be fair. Uh, I can choose not to use Facebook. I cannot, if I want to access anything on the internet, I cannot choose to not use Comcast in my apartment. I, that's it. You are, you have the pipe into my apartment, and you have the pipe out of my apartment. My choice is to use you or to move. And that's it. Um, so again, yeah. So the reason why I brought this up is that there is a large portion of Congress that really does think that there should be one rule to apply to the networks and the edge providers as well. And as long as we're not going, as long as we're going to have a rule, it needs to be a universal rule that applies to everyone. And that's actually why Congress struck down the broadband privacy rule uh, several months ago. And there are a large number of members of Congress, particularly on the Republican side, particularly on the Committee of Jurisdiction, who really do think that there should be one universal law that covers all of the internet, both on the internet and the, sub, uh, the infrastructure. And to make that political argument, they, cre they scheduled a hearing and said, Netflix, Facebook, YouTube, uh, Google, you guys get down here and you tell us what you think we should do about net neutrality. And Google and Facebook, that, that's what this meeting is. Yeah. And, and Google and Facebook said, <laughs> net neutrality is not about us. We aren't an infrastructure provider. We don't build networks. This doesn't make any sense. And they pushed back and didn't want to participate in this political theater. Um, so there's there's a lot of games being played. Yeah, and, and the flip side of all of this is, and the, again, the privacy rule, I worked on that a lot, so again, soapbox. Um, and then we need to move on. And then we need to move on. Uh, but I will say, like, you know, the other deciding factor is, like, I, I use Google services. I go into Google, and again, we can have a debate about how much you know that they're collecting data on you, and that is a perennial topic of debate, but I get their services for free in exchange for my data. I think, ah, oh, I got a pretty handy service. Here's, keep my search engine history. Same deal with Facebook, like serve me ads, keep the, whatever, I'm getting a service out of it. I am paying Comcast for the privilege of getting hosed. Like, <laughs> there is a fundamental difference that. in that. Um, it's also great when the service I paid for goes out just about every week while I'm trying to have a conference call. Uh, next question, please. Um. Well, we're all talking about um, Netflix and, uh, you know, and the same thing would probably apply to Hulu and everything, but um, what, does all, um, what does all this have to do with the, um, with like DirecTV and, um, and the cable companies and with their, uh, no, 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 they have stream, well, you could stream, uh, you could stream on there on, you know, with them also, you know, like on demand or something like that. So what, so, I mean, is this all going to apply to them also? Yeah, yes. so as long as they run a cable broadband operation, that will apply to the cable broadband side of their their operation. Um, there's a lot of concern with, um, again, this comes up with zero rating, this comes up with throttling. If I'm AT&T and I run a, I have a broadband ISP component, and I also got all this programming that I own, um, you know, I've got a, I don't know, I do not have cable, um, shockingly. Um, but uh, so if I'm AT&T and say I have a deal with HBO, 
okay? And I can get you, by your at t subscription, you get special access to the Game of Thrones episodes as they're airing, for example. Uh, I, and you can also conceivably get these Game of Thrones episodes from somewhere else. Maybe, you know, that's that's a nice service you got there, Hulu. It would be a shame if something happened to it. And yeah, uh, the, the, with, the, with the DirecTV specifically, this is a large part of why they merged with AT&T why AT&T bought them. They wanted access to DirecTV content. They wanted to be able to give AT&T subscribers, uh, both on Uverse and on mobile, the ability to stream DirecTV essentially for free if you're a DirecTV customer, where it doesn't count against your data caps. That's the zero rating stuff. Yeah, and that's why they're trying to do that. They're tr and, and then you don't, that doesn't count against your data caps. Well, guess what? Netflix does count against your data caps. If you're close on your data, which one are you more likely to stream? Which ads are you more likely to see by going to DirecTV instead of Netflix? Uh, and this is a big problem. Again, so talking about the the um, the, uh, uh, the antitrust things we were talking about earlier, how do you define the market? Um, putting the antitrust hat back on, this is vertical integration is the, the technical term for this. Horizontal, immigra horizontal immigration, hello. Horizontal integration would be like if uh, Comcast went out and bought Charter, okay? That's two companies in the same line of business and they're just consolidating. That's what we normally think about when we think about antitrust. Vertical integration is Comcast buying NBC. Uh, that is vertical integration. That's when all of a sudden everything from the production line all the way down starts getting pulled under one roof. And when you have like one part of your business that's responsible for delivering another part of your business in a different market, which is presumably subject to its own competitive pressures, all of a sudden, all those competitive pressures start working at odds with one another, and you have a lot of incentives to start behaving badly. So that's kind of the big concern now is when you've got these like mega corporations like gobbling up all these different kind of areas under one roof. And I just want to be clear, in terms of corporate structure, vertical integration is not necessarily a bad thing. It can oftentimes, it makes sense for businesses to streamline their supply chain by buying their own suppliers because not only can they get their own products more cheaply, they can now sell those products to their competitors. The problem is when you have such large companies, only two or three players in a market the size of the United States, where that begins to be less of a internal cost savings thing and more of a, hey, we're just going to do this so we have total market power thing. Next question, please. So, uh, like a lot of people, I have parents. And like most people, they're older than I am. <laughs> <laughs> so, yes, uh, do we want to talk about how my dad had to FaceTime me this morning to fix his computer? Sort of. Um, they, uh, my parents tend to uh, differ politically as well. And it seems like one side of the aisle has uh, a view of net neutrality that is not as favorable question is, how do I explain net neutrality to my parents? Well, I, I think you go back to the whole idea of the, the verbiage net neutrality is somewhat misleading. You really need to take it down to a base level of freedom of access to information on the internet and who controls that. I mean, it's, it's just breaking it down to the most basic terms. Dad, do you like the internet? Don't let them screw it up. Yeah. There you go. <laughs> My, uh, my question is, uh, didn't the uh, U.S. taxpayer actually pay to create and build the Internet? So why don't we uh, – is, so is, is that the case? It, it, not, not, not really. Um, it was created by universities and research organizations. Uh, uh, DARPA was involved for some part of it, but really uh, the backbone of the Internet, the, the actual Internet we use every day, has all been private organizations. Yeah. I don't know how yet. <laughs> oh, that's going back. Uh, more questions? Yeah. Raise your hand if you have a question. <laughs> well, <laughs> well, you have the box, so you can yes. speak now. That's right, that's right. So what are other countries doing? Oh, I think I that's should a answer very good this question. One. So my organization runs a... Uh, a network called This Is Net Neutrality, and we monitor net neutrality around the world. And oddly enough, uh, telecom policy is an area where the United States really leads. Uh, in fact, after we passed the, the 2015 telecom order, uh, the European regulator, Barrick, looked at that and said, yeah, that sounds like a pretty good idea. And they passed a very similar rule. Now they're very confused about what we're doing, and they're actually coming to DC in September to ask, what are we doing? 
Uh, There's a but, lot of the world that's confused about what we're doing. But they have hardline rules. Uh, in India, they have hardline rules, and a lot of them did it after following our lead. Uh, so in most places around the world, net neutrality is not only like the rule of the internet, but also has legal protections. It's also cheaper and, and more available. But yeah, in some places, sure. In some places, they have actually gone so far as to designate the internet a public utility. And it is treated like a full public utility. That is what the ISPs were all fearing when the FCC decided to reclassify it as Title II because it's common, it's becomes what's known as a common carrier. It's not quite public utility status, but it's very, very close. Uh, and the utilities, uh, or the telecom carriers, obviously do not want to be public utilities because once you're a public utility, your profit margin goes poof. But I think this is where we have to look at it from a, a more educated standpoint. We have public school systems now that are only putting books on tablets, and if you don't have internet access at home, you're going to fail. Your children will fail. So I think we have to look at it in a, in a broader sense and, damn it, I can't get my Netflix today. It's more like, damn it, I want my daughter to get through college. Next question, please. Yes. Um, the, uh, one of the fundamental flaws is just what you're talking about, the natural mop monopoly, the local last mile. I think, uh, is there any way to back off that uh, interactive services Act. That really created the present monopoly problem uh, in the, or the shared monopoly we have at the local level because we don't have a common carrier on that last pipe, last mile pipe. If we had a common carrier, you'd have a half a dozen uh, internet service providers using that common carrier. Is there any hope of fixing that really flawed decision in my putting, fundamental? Putting my Comcast hat back on completely unrelated to this conversation, I also spend a lot of time and money lobbying states to make it illegal for cities to build their own internet. Totally unrelated, though. Yeah. Um, no, I mean, that's, that's the million dollar question. Um, I think you're right. There are just, in the way that the market has grown in the United States, by choices and by accident and by technological innovation and by crawling by inches, we have ended up with a system that has a lot of natural bugs built into it. Uh, you know, they're bugs if you're a consumer, they're features if you're a company. Um, so I don't know. Uh, I can say with relative, yeah, I'd say probably 70% certainty that the political will to actually fix this in a meaningful overhaul is just zero. Um, I think there's too much of an entrenched interest at this point. Um, I think whatever gains we make are going to have to be, you know, probably very wonky and hopefully revolutionary in their own way. Um, I don't, I can't see Congress sitting down and just rewriting the Telecom Act to like, I don't know, as a hypothetical solution, just like nationalize the pipes. Um, I don't think I will see that happen in the next 20 years probably. It would also be very expensive because they'd have to basically use eminent domain to take ownership of all of it and Comcast and all of them would get a lot of money cash out to their shareholders. Um, real quick, I wanted to go back to an earlier question with the explaining it to your parents. Um, ask your parents how much they like having to pay more money to gain access to the more specialty channels on cable TV. And if they don't like that, then they should support net neutrality, internet freedom, because otherwise that's what their, cable, that's what their broadband internet will look like in two or three years. Uh, we've got time for a couple more questions. I want to save a couple minutes at the end to talk about the future of net neutrality and what next steps are. So next question, please. Yeah, can you comment on the attempts to block municipalities from becoming ISPs? Uh, uh, as Comcast, I think that would be really, really bad. I'm building out networks, and I don't think that you should be, uh, a, a, as a nonprofit, building out competition against me. If you want me to build into your network, I need that to be a profit-making ent entity, and if you're doing it for free, how am I supposed to make any money? And if I can't make any money, I'm not going to build out any internet in your neighborhood. But you're already not building out internet in my neighborhood. <laughs> and, and, oh yeah, you were given billions of dollars to do this already. We can also say that most of those experiences have failed really badly. It's just fallen, you know, first off, it's never going to be fast enough because fast enough means it has to be really expensive and the city's not going to pay for that. And second, you then have issues of uh, policing it. Uh, it. Bringing the city in as a carrier it doesn't exclude them from the idea of, well, people can do really bad things on this network that you're providing for free and we can't get that shut off to people. Yeah, there is, I mean, there is, like, 
the the takeaway here is that building an internet network is really expensive, yes. like really ungodly expensive. Um, and if you are a city, so there, it's it's state by state. Um, uh, from a from a political perspective, it is a lot easier for Verizon and Comcast and AT and T to go and lobby the state legislature of Kentucky. I'm just going to pick on Kentucky because that's where my office mate is from. Um, to go to the legislature in the state of Kentucky, who probably honestly haven't dealt with this a lot, and certainly not as much as some members of Congress, and say like, "Look, this is bad. If you let towns do this, like, there's a bunch of uppity towns that are trying to build their own municipal broadband network." Uh, and if you let them do this, we're going to stop building out into rural parts of your state, which if you're in Kentucky, that's a good portion of your state. Um, yes. And it's the, the political threshold to convince people is a lot lower when you go on a state by state level. Um, so you've got a lot of patchwork rules, um, a lot of places where you could, in theory, build out your own municipal broadband, but you'd also have to be a power utility. Uh, is a great example. You'd have to also build up power lines. So it's it's a sort of a public choice problem. Uh, one more quick question, please. Uh, yes, let's say hypothetically I contacted the FCC on their uh, platform that you could do that on and it turned into a spam bot fest. And let's say <laughs> hypothetically uh, the congressional people I contact are really slow about getting back in contact with me. Are there any secondary avenues that, as an individual, I can kind of turn the echo chamber into more of a microphone so people can hear our complaints a little better? We promised this was not an audience plant. That is the perfect question to segue into the finale about what to do next. <laughs> yeah. Uh, so we, uh, I, I did not pay for this, but there was recently some polling done uh, based on a firm in D.C., and it found that 88% uh, of people support net neutrality, including 83% of Republicans. Everyone supports net neutrality. The problem is only 45% of people have ever heard of it. This is an issue that we win by telling people it's an issue. So you don't necessarily even need to tell Ajit Pai. He, he knows. He, he's gotten lots and lots of messages. He's going to do what he's going to do. We win by telling our friends about it and saying, hey, this is a really important issue. Please watch this 20-minute John Oliver skit. It's actually kind of funny. We win by making sure Congress knows that we know that this is an issue. The FCC might undo this rule. We don't know what they're going to do. They're going to announce it probably in the next few months. If they do, Congress is going to have a lot of pressure to do something, and the conversation is going to turn then. And thank you for this question. My organization has a booth just on this floor next to the TARDIS, and we're actually driving phone calls. We have your, your senator's phone numbers, and you can come over, and we will call from the TARDIS, and you can tell your senator exactly what you think about net neutrality. <laughs> any other final thoughts from any of our panelists? All right, I want to thank our panelists for being here tonight. And thank you all for coming out. Hope it was informative. Thank you very much.